Could anybody tell me what this figure represents? What does it mean? What does this connection have with it? What does this figure have with anything? Nobody recognize it? You're all daring, wide awake people. Come and give me an idea. Can you repeat? It could be that, but it's not. Anybody else want to give us an idea? The number of illiterate people in Spain? But no, the hours we spend in school? No, that's not. This number actually refers very well to between parents and children. Does that help you? Types of games? No. Second clue. It links parents with children between the ages of 2 and 10. The hours they're together. No. <laughs> Wonderful. You've just ruined my talk. You've given the game the answer away, but you're quite right. It's the number of times we say no, assuming you say no 12 times to our kids every day over t well, 10 years. But since uh, my children are a little naughtier than most, they've actually increased the average. But that's it. This is the number of times we say no. And that's what I want to talk about in this talk. The educational milieu in which our children are growing up and what we have to do so that they can grow a little better. I'm talking to you from two different points of view. My humble experience in the last five years where I left my previous jobs and I started working with young children in Spain to encourage innovation, creativity and talent and an entrepreneurial spirit. I've now worked with more than a quarter of a million of these children in Spain. And also I want to speak from the perspective of a study that we participated in with the Level Learning Institute in which we worked with children from Asia, Europe and the United States asking them about the future and how they saw the future of their education, what they thought that they would need. When we asked them, we found when the educational system was furthest away from gameplay, from creativity, when it had rigid systems, the further away it was from dynamics and independence, it created least interest in the kids. And it's been shown that the Chinese educational system or the French educational system, which are both extremely rigid and create a great deal of disenchantment among the pupils. So what happens? We all know that if the children are not interested, there's no satisfaction, there's no enthusiasm. If we are not in a happy context, we don't like to work. We can all extrapolate that to where we work. Just imagine spending 15 years of your life in a hostile environment where you have no interest. 15 years. The, the most important 15 years for the creation and development of a child's brain. When I hear these so-called world leaders who come to us and tell us we have to go back to the traditional systems based on memorization, rote learning and the authority of school teachers, really I find it frightening because it's going backwards, completely the opposite idea of what children think they need. And I think they should at least ask their clients, the children, what they want. Because remember, the client is the child, not the father or the parent of the child. So we've taken the trouble to ask children what they want and how they see their future. And what is it they want from school? And I can sum up what they said in three main ideas, but these three ideas are shared by children in China, in Europe, and also in the United States. Recently, 
I got a phone call from a colleague in Singapore. She's the world director for Hewlett Packard's large format printers. And she asked me, how is it that when we hire the best engineers from all over the world, they're unable to establish good contacts with our clients and understand the needs of our clients? I think the answer is obvious. Because in the three years that engineer spends at university, nobody's bothered to give them any training in human contacts, in personal relationships. No one's bothered to tell them how to listen. No one has bothered with a whole number of elements that we see are more and more necessary nowadays. But when we design our syllabuses for students, we do it on the basis of what we were taught as children, not on what our children want to learn. The problem is that the children have an, an inbuilt ability to know what they want to learn. And this ability lets them know which skills and qualities they're going to need. The video games that were mentioned, so slighted by parents, they actually hide a great deal of complexity. Complexity that they will find very necessary in their future lives. I don't know how to play with a video game. When I've tried to learn, I never got past the first screen. And as soon as a kid gets a new video game, they will all know immediately how to resolve screen after screen very quickly and without any instructions. It's clear this is a prelude to the kind of complexity that children are going to have to deal with in their future jobs. And that's why they love video games. If you want to I can give you a test, give them a kid a screen with a keyboard or an iPad with a touch screen or an, an, a, a pen and paper. Just give all three options to a child and see which one they choose. I don't think there is any doubt. They all know they're going to need an iPad and that's what they go for. Just as we were never shown a, a computer keyboard at school and nowadays we're all connected to a uh, keyboard. It's also clear that when we ask children about how they imagined the future, they describe a school without walls, without, with lots of light, lots of technology, open tables, no hierarchies, no rigid structures. And that's precisely what we're beginning to see in the most advanced companies that are beginning to develop these offices. And uh, our kids haven't been in those offices, I can assure you. But they have this ability to understand what's going to be needed in the future. Deep down, this is quite simply the evolution of thought. We start by studying astrology because someone was curious to find out why did those things up in the sky move. From that it generated knowledge and this is knowledge that we are transmitting from one generation to the next. But only on the basis of that curiosity, that innate desire to learn, that curiosity is how it's been possible for the human race to evolve over history. So the first conclusion is that kids have this innate ability that lets them know what they need to learn. So, But first let's have an artistic break. This is an exercise we did with some kids. We asked them to draw a robot that would help them in their day-to-day -day life. This is a robot, rather a complex model. It so will stand guard over anywhere while you're not at home. If anybody tries to come in, you need to type in a key in a secret code. If you get it wrong, there's a siren which will appear, an alarm that will sound at the house and on your phone. So this child is very imaginative. But I, perhaps later on they'll want to be a public servant or find a job with zero creativity. Here you have another child with a very complex robot which includes TDT, DVD player, a hairdressing salon, screwdriver, everything, lots of, lots of things. 
But if you think these two drawings are rather disperse, let me show you another one that's a little more specific. <laughs> this robot helps me blow my nose. So let's see the second definition, the second conclusion, rather, of this study. My conclusion is that children want new ways of learning. They want to learn through playing, through sharing experiences. They want to learn through creativity, through innovation. They want to see new ways that will allow them to explore. The old ways of teaching for most children today are completely obsolete and don't produce any motivation whatsoever. They want to combine different sources of information. They want to combine video and real face-to-face -face experiences with remote experiences, which is really not so different from what we already have in the form of e-learning. They want something that will allow them to combine different elements in order to respond to the needs of each child in line and at the pace that those children need. They want to make their own discoveries. They want to try things out and apply their knowledge to different situations. And deep down, just like in the US and universities that we put up as examples, but which isn't as common as we would like, what they would like to have is to work with the case study. No want to be working in teams. And they want to be working without exams. And nobody's going to doubt that the graduates of such and such a university know nothing. But in fact, what's happened is that those universities have been able to motivate them enough so that the students have studied without having to uh, threaten them with an exam or a grade. The children prefer to learn how to learn rather than learn how to do. Now, continuing with this uh, art gallery of children's art, here you have uh, this five-year-old who's already, is very intuitive, he's saying this robot will help me to convert bad people into good people. The third and last conclusion is that children want mentors they want facilitators, leaders, who will guide them to what they want to learn, rather than the old-fashioned uh, teacher. They want one-to-one -one contact, or many-to-many, -many, rather than one-to-many. They don't want to see a lecture, or a teacher giving a lecture on a subject. That's an old-fashioned concept, because they, they don't respect the principle of authority any longer. They also want to learn with the key concept of adaptability. They want education to adapt to the pace of each and every one of the students and to the style of the students. And this goes very close, very closely hand in hand with what I said before about e-learning. E-learning allows us to set the pace and to individualize the style for each individual. Let me share a story with you. Do you know the impact on a child? At th three years old until the age of six while they're at uh, preschool, obligatory preschool, while they're uh, sitting and working with other colleagues around a table, working and drawing. And then at six years old, they enter primary school and now they're going to be sit seated individually looking at the back of the head of the, the, the classmate instead of sharing, instead of working together face to face. The impact of that is huge, but since we never ask them, nobody seems to care about it. And if anybody wants to ask, does this mean a change in the education system? Then of course it does. But fortunately, as with everything in life, an unforeseen X factor has arrived that's allowed us to change this very quickly. Have you ever heard of the One Plus One program? That's a computer for every child in the classroom. That's really going to be our salvation. Because what that program's going to do, it's already doing it, is generate totally individualized learning systems. 
It's already in place in this current academic year, and it will be the case in two or three years in secondary schools too here in Spain. It's working and advancing very, very quickly. And in this academic year, in some experiments of virtual stores, obviously with the cooperation of the teachers, the students will be able to download an application for 80 cents or 60 cents. They'll be able to show them how uh, the heart works and they'll be able to see how it works or what's the function of a heart. And for only 70 or 80 cents, they'll be able to access the main principles of physics very well illustrated. So this is a little the good news that progress is being made and I would say despite some of the teachers. I could go on much more about uh, motivation of students but uh, today I don't have time. Yeah, in fact I think I've run out of time that's why the next slide is not coming up. <laughs> so just to conclude I want to say that our children will be living in a very complex society in which they'll have to resolve problems that we cannot even imagine now. They will have to apply skills and abilities that are innate in them and they'll have to apply knowledge to situations that are completely new. With what we give them in the books, they're not going to have enough. So we have to let them learn naturally these new concepts that are very, very unusual and difficult for us. And we can't understand them because we don't understand them. We veto them, but we have to let our children learn them. Because basically the conclusion of all I've been saying is that if we were to start listening to what our children are asking for, if we actually give them a chance to find their vocation and give them facilitate that vocation instead of imposing the techniques of a hundred years ago, then we would begin to understand what those children need to know for their future. Thank you very much for your attention.